language and you know did we really you know did we really get anywhere that we hadn't been before and yeah when I'm in this mood I say oh we got a lot out of Wittgenstein and the parts of Quine, Sellers and you that as it were you know reinforce Wittgenstein but in you know in our sense of what philosophy could do for us have we gotten beyond the period of Mach and James? Uh, and I honestly don't know the answer to that. I mean, sometimes I think the linguistic turn was a great flood of light. Sometimes I think it was, you know, particularly when I read a nice arrangement of it, <laughs> uh, I think it was just sort of a transitional stage from an intellectual period when we had a discipline called philosophy that had a kind of autonomy to the kind of sociologized and historicized conception of philosophy that Dewey had as just sort of, you know, kibitzing over alternative, you know, discourses within the culture and, you know, cleaning up some loose edges and perhaps, you know, offering imaginative suggestions here and there. And I still, you know, I still wander back and forth. When I'm in Europe and I'm trying to explain that analytic philosophy is really important and, you know, they ought to read you and they ought to read Sellers and, you know, they ought to read Wittgenstein, I take one line. When I'm, a, when I'm at home, <laughs> I tend to say, you know, you know, we've been doing this sort of thing for 50 years now and, you know, maybe we should drop Maybe we should drop meaning as a topic, reference as a topic. You know, maybe we should, you know, give this a rest. <laughs> um, anyway, do you have any reflections on any of this stuff? Oh, well, uh, it does seem to me that that uh, philosophy of change has changed a lot since since uh, I, I was interested in it in, in college and graduate school. Uh, and 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 one one difference is that at least for a lot of the time between then and now, uh, it, it's been much further away from what ordinary people were interested in and could easily read, and uh, has had much less engagement with with popular culture and and politics for that matter, uh, then it was almost taken for granted that it had then. Uh, to what extent that is geared to the extent to which it's become technical uh, in this country, I don't know, because after all, one of the people that, uh, that have, have had, a, had a good deal of influence and was certainly read by many people was Russell. Uh, and and uh, he's one of the, I mean, he had difficult ideas. Uh, he was very good at expressing them in a way that people could understand, but, uh, uh, but it wasn't that he didn't do what we would consider to be technical philosophy. He certainly did, but he, but he also did, he wrote a lot about politics and morals and so on. Uh, how uh, we, how uh, further, so I, I'm not, I'm not sure about the explanation. I mean, I, did the linguistic turn make philosophy less available? Uh, I guess I just don't know because after all, Wittgenstein was part of the linguistic turn, uh, and, and although I don't think he's had a lot of political influence, uh, uh, he certainly has had an influence outside of philosophy, uh, and very, very considerable. Uh, so I'm at a loss to, th uh, I think appropriately, uh, at, a, at a loss to think of explanations of, for why philosophy has lost touch to the extent that it has. Um, it might partly be just that there's so many more of them mm. yeah. that they can constitute their own audience in a way that, I mean, when I was an undergraduate, you know, there were five or six people at Harvard who 
were, had, had a voice in public. Uh, R.B. Perry and Hawking, uh, these, these people were known to a, a large public, and they, they, and Whitehead, of course, uh, they, they thought of themselves as uh, having important things to say to, to the general public on education and all sorts of issues. And philosophers that in general don't have that feeling, though of course so, some of them do write on what they think to be very important social problems. They don't expect to be listened to by senators. And, mm -hmm. so, uh, and I think this is bad. I, I, think, I think it's a shame. Not, not, not that I tend, intend to mend my own ways, but, but um, But you have mended your ways. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I guess I don't. Yeah, you know, I don't think it would matter if nobody who taught in a philosophy department was ever heard of by anybody outside a philosophy department. I mean, you know, there there will always be intellectuals who will you know, give yeah. their views on you know politics, society, culture, whatnot. And if you know if they happen to be in, they happen to be philosophers, fine. If not it doesn't matter. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess what what I'm that's maybe I'm not clear what I'm worried about. Um, the way I think of it, uh, this is the line I've been pressing for 20 years, ever since I wrote Mirror of Nature, is that uh, Frege and Russell, as it were, reverted to Kant's picture of what philosophy was. Namely, it you know did something with form instead of content. <laughs> It rose above mm -hmm. the empirical, or it rose above the historical, or it rose above something, and you know it had you know, conceptual analysis or something. And the reason there's this great big analytic continental gap is that for the rest of the philosophical world, Kant is sort of dead, <laughs> and you know Hegel and Nietzsche took his place. And so when they think of being a philosopher, they think Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, and of course you've got to read Kant, because Hegel is unintelligible without right. Kant, you know, all that, but still, you don't, you don't want to do what Kant thought philosophy was, and the Anglophones do want to do what Kant thought philosophy was. Mm. Um, okay. And sometimes I think that, you know, we need both within the same discipline. Sometimes I think, no, the, Anglo the Anglophones are caught in a time lag, you know, that the rest of the world moved on, and we, you know, we let Frege recontianize us, or Frege and his heirs recontianize us. And like I say, I tend to talk out of both sides of my mouth, depending on what part of the world I'm in. What, 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 what is the, the, the huge difference that you see between Kant and the post-Kantians? The, I think the huge difference is um, Kant had a scheme content distinction, Hegel and Dewey didn't. Uh, that is, for Hegel, scheme was always turning into content. Kind of, you, know, you know, like for Dewey, means are always fading into ends and vice versa. For right. both him and Hegel, scheme and content were just, you know, temporary, arbitrary, sociologically, historically determined considerations. I, I, I think that's still sort of anathema to most Anglophone philosophers. I mean, they, I think, want there to be, you know, a philosophical method, no, maybe not a method, but, you know, a philosophical activity characterized by being on the scheme side, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you like. And it seems to me that everything that's happened to break down all the Kantian distinctions in the course of the development of analytic philosophy as it were, cut the metaphilosophical ground out from under analytic philosophy. So the Anglophone world is sort of doing a kind, you know, it's still, you know, in its public rhetoric goes on and on about, you know, clarity of concepts and conceptual confusion and, you know, we'll clear, clear up your concepts for you. You know, back at home, they don't, you know, they don't think there are such things as concepts to be clarified. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, you know, they're alternative uses of words. So it's as if, uh, at the end of the dialectic that followed the linguistic turn, 
we had no room for Kant style philosophy, but as a disciplinary matrix, we still look to Kant for you know, giving us a sense of our place in culture, our relation to the other disciplines, and so on. Yeah, well, if, if the scheme content distinction is the, is, is the mark, then it, it not only continued after Kant, but, uh, I mean, all of the logical positivists in one way or another certainly accepted it. Uh, and it, it, at least in Anglophone, well, in, in what we roughly call analytic philosophy, uh, it com what became completely embedded uh, in the subject. Now, whether that means a strong distinction between analytic and synthetic is a related question, but it's not exactly the same 